Okay, so chapter 24 is about calcium, ho calcium homeostasis, hormonal regulation, how we get the calcium in our bodies, how we get rid of too much of it, maintaining a good level of blood calcium. So um, first I'm going to go through a couple little things with you and then we'll talk about some more stuff like what's actually in the chapter um so here we go calcium you guys know is the primarily in our bones okay um we know that we can we store most of our calcium in our bones and in our teeth okay as the complex called hydroxyapatite that's the mineral that gets put on the collagen okay so where can we find calcium well the other place that we can find it is in the extracellular areas so the plasma um and in plasma about half of it is ionized um about 40 percent of it is bound to proteins like albumin right because that's a major plasma protein and then some of it is like that last 10 percent is complex with other stuff okay um the active calcium is ionized calcium and if you guys remember we talked about ionized calcium um when we were talking about electrolytes and to determine how much ionized calcium there actually is in a patient's bloodstream you have to use an ion selective electrode okay if you're just looking at total calcium um you're going for the colorimetric method using the orthocresolphthalein complexum got that um so this is a big deal okay if you don't have enough calcium in your body um, it affects a lot of different things so what can it affect well calcium is necessary for your nerves to work properly and it's necessary for your muscles to work properly and it's essential for your heart muscles to work properly so if your nerves aren't going to work properly they can't get the message to the muscles the muscles can't contract heart can't contract oh what happens you die um so <laughs> calcium levels are extremely important to try to keep normal um another thing that can happen with um too much calcium is everything gets overstimulated and you end up going in having um death in a totally different way so e either way you you need to try to maintain good levels of calcium um one of the real concerns with hypercalcemia is um the that the primary regulator and we've talked about this before the primary regulator of your blood calcium levels is parathyroid hormone and there is something called hyperparathyroidism which would mean that then we were getting too much calcium into the bloodstream because something's going on with the parathyroid primary hyperparathyroidism is typically due to some sort of a, a tumor of some sort or some sort of growth it could be non-cancerous or it can be cancerous so it can be malignant or benign um but it typically happens at the area of the parathyroid glands if you remember the parathyroid glands are located on the back side of the thyroid gland so hyper calcemia can be a problem because of hyperparathyroidism okay hypocalcemia um when you have too little calcium then we start getting cardiac arrhythmias we get laryngospasms we get respiratory arrest um <clears throat> meaning that you stop breathing um typically due to laryngospasms um you your hands and your feet start getting spasms in them and 
start getting cramps and you can't release, relax your hands um, from the tetany that sets in. And this can happen because of a decreased parathyroid hormone or a decreased vitamin D. Okay, vitamin D is also, in its active form, is a hormone. Okay, so those two hormones, parathyroid hormone and vitamin D3, okay, are the two primary hormones that regulate your calcium levels. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the hypocalcemia. Um, and I believe that I talked about these before when we did the electrolytes. So this should be nothing new. So I'm not going into great detail on them. I'm just pretty much going with... Sorry, um, your lab just interrupted me. Um, <clears throat> so rickets is a condition that is usually affects children. And what will happen is um, they don't get enough vitamin D, typically through from their diet, because that's how we get vitamin D in our systems. Uh, and so they'll end up having not enough structure in the bones. Um, not enough mineralization and the the long bones start bowing um, and they can end up with just really poorly deformed skeletons okay the bone pain is is pretty rough um, for them so not not cool um, Okay, so rickets is typically children. Osteomalacia can happen to anybody, and then typically happens to um, adults, um, because this is the softening of the bone. So the bone had already formed, and now it's being demineralized and softening because the collagen is still present, um, but the minerals are no longer there. So as you can see in the picture, normal bone is, has a lot more um, mineralization. There's a lot more structure to it. And osteomalacia has a lot more space in there. So less structure, less dense. It uh, The weight that you're supporting helps to start bowing the bones. Um, and two of the more well, three of the more common um, causes of osteomalacia is celiac disease, um, so that you have an absorption issue um, of calcium, okay, because that's how we get calcium in the body. That's twice I've said that now. Um, and or the, the kidney or liver failure or dysfunction, okay, and I'll talk about that in a little bit because that's all about the vitamin D, which affects the absorption of calcium, which is how we get it into our system through dietary absorption through GI tract. That's three times now. Okay. If you don't get it by the end of this, this lecture, then we're going to be in trouble. Okay. So the osteoporosis is the, the disease condition in which we talk about all the time. Like we, people hear about this, you know, what's going on, blah, 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 blah. Um, so osteoporosis uh, is, again, um, degrading or demineralization of the bones. Um, it happens very commonly in postmenopausal women. Um, Caucasians and Asian women tend to be hit hardest with this. Um, and the reason for the postmenopausal piece is because estrogen... Um, helps to maintain the calcium deposition on the bones. So it helps to maintain it. And once your estrogen levels are, are decreased, then um, that whole keeping the calcium in place doesn't really work as well. Um, I could go into a very long lecture on how that works with the hormones, but I'd really rather not because that'll be like another 20 minutes. <laughs> 
Um, so it, if you want, go look it up. Explain it'll it's it's explainable. It really is. It's actually pretty kind of simple. Um, but there's a lot of hormone crap that goes on in there. Um, so women who are in their forties typically, um, still have normal estrogen levels going on, but most women hit menopause around age 51, 50 to 52 is typically the, the target age. Um, and so by the age of 60, we can start seeing structural changes in the women. So they're not staying quite as upright anymore um, because the mineralization of the spine is starting to degrade. Okay. By the age of 70, that's when, you know, a lot of them start getting a little hump on the back and they're benched, uh, hunched over by the age of 80 or 90. They're like, you know, super scrunched down or they have lost height. That's the other thing. When they start losing height, this is a problem. Now, I said that this is a women thing primarily, right? That does not mean that men cannot get osteoporosis. And as a matter of fact, when you do not have adequate levels of testosterone, okay, it's estrogen for females, testosterone for the males, the adequate levels of testosterone, um, as, as men get older, the testosterone levels decrease and the testosterone for males are the one is the hormone that helps to maintain that bone integrity, um, and composition. So men also get osteoporosis. Oh, look, this guy just fractured a hip. Okay. This is the most common hip fracture. It's actually on the femur. It's not actually on the, the iliac, um, ilia iliac crest or pelvic bone. It's actually a femur thing. It's to, it can be the head, but it's a lot of times it happens like right in here too. Um, so hip fractures big time. Um, so any type of falling with impact can be a problem. So when you get old, um, and you're going to fall, try not to brace yourself on impact try to just kind of roll with the punches if you can. Um, because you see what he did. He, um, put his hand down to try to brace the impact and put his knee down to try to brace the impact. And what ended up happening was a whole bunch of weight stopping dead and snapped off the head of the femur. So try to roll, land and roll instead of trying to stop yourself from falling. I know it's, it's really hard thing to do. Um, I had to learn that early in life because of a fractured arm that if I try to brace myself from falling on with my right arm, I'm going down anyway, because I don't have, my elbow is not mineralized. So <laughs> it's, um, it's interesting. Okay. There's another thing that's called Paget's disease. Okay. I forgot to put the, the thing on here. Paget's disease. Oh, here we go. Paget's P-A-G-E-T apostrophe S disease. Um, this is a problem with the bone recycling or remodelization. So in your bones, your osteoclasts and osteoblasts are constantly building and degrading and, and remodeling your bone constantly. Okay. To make sure that we're having nice, good structure. It's, it's, you know, um, doing what it's supposed to do. Otherwise, if you let your cells have nothing to do, they're going to get really bored and lazy and not want to do anything. Right. So they, they're constantly remodeling your bone and doing stuff. Well, what happens with Paget's disease is the remodelization, um, or the recycling remodel, re Fig configuring, um, ends up with weird shaped bones. Okay. Um, so instead of the normal, um, calcaneus, okay, we have this wider, more open calcaneus on the other hand or on the other foot. Okay. Notice that this one single, um, 
carpal, no, metacarpal, sorry, metacarpal that's right here, okay, that would belong to the, the middle phalanx, right, um, that guy is larger, and if you notice, it's got a lot more bone tissue, so it's bigger, it's wider, um, some, most of the time, Paget's ends up with more space in them, um, and they end up looking like fluffy bones, like this skull, okay, the chance, uh, the chances of accumulating or acquiring Paget's disease is, is, increases with your age, um, the women that are over the age of 65 tend to be more common, um, recipients, I don't know what you call this, uh, patients with Paget's disease. Um, it does affect uh, the pelvis, the skull, the spine, and the legs, but as you can see, here we go, um, the hands and feet can also be um, affected, but uh, in the United States, we have about 3 million cases of Paget's every year. Okay, and I'm not sure how old those those numbers are. Right? That could be about what's today, 2021. Let's see, like four four or five years old. Um, so just so you know, that's that's still it, this is a very real thing. This is weird, but it happens, and you never hear about. It. Okay, um, <clears throat> so working with. what I'm talking about, calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium, all three of those are important to the mineralization of the bones. Hydroxyapatite is where the calcium and the phosphorus complex together, okay, to form that mineralization on the bones. Magnesium is also in there. Calcium will, will, will bind with phosphates too, or the phosphorus. So, <clears throat> the hydroxyapatite of your bones is also a good source of phosphorus for the formation of your phospholipids, your nucleic acids, your energy, ATP, ADP, right? Diphosphate, triphosphate, you've heard this stuff, okay? Um, typically, we don't have deficiencies in phosphorus. Um, you get enough in your diet. It's easy to absorb. We even if we were to excrete like as much as we could possibly excrete, you're never gonna run out. Um, so even doing a phosphate level is like next to stupid. The only reason we do them typically is because calcium and phosphorus levels typically are opposite each other. So if the calcium goes up, the phosphorus usually goes down. If the phosphorus goes up and the calcium goes down, we're good, right? But then with, if you start seeing both of them rising or both of them falling, there's something weird going on, okay? That's typically affecting bones or kidneys or something like that. So you have to look a little harder at some other values, okay? So Again, phosphorus is um, measured with a colorimetric assay. Typically, um, the ammonium molybdate forms the phospho-molybdate complex that turns the special color and we're good to go. Okay. <clears throat> Magnesium, <clears throat> I said, also complexes with calcium and the phosphorus. Um, typically, the magnesium is found more commonly on the surface of the bones, not so much on the internal structures of the bones. Um, <clears throat> and it tends to be, uh, be in its um, bound forms um, or complex forms found in soft tissues. Okay. So, um, you have plenty of magnesium in your, in your skin structure and things like that. So, um, magnesium, again, active my magnesium is ionized. It can also travel in the bloodstream, complexed or bound to proteins or complexed with other things like the phosphate and whatnot. Um, magnesium is 
is also extremely important in that whole nerve conduction, um, energy metabolism. Okay, so kidneys decrease magnesium levels, bones increase magnesium levels, so that we, we never really have a true hypermagnesemia or hypomagnesemia. The, the body will fix that. Okay. Um, again, ionized magnesium measured by ion selective electrodes and total magnesium levels by colorimetric assays. So calcium homeostasis. Okay. Um, serum calcium is kept at a relatively constant level. I already told you that the main, the way that we get calcium into the body is through the GI tract. It has to be absorbed through the GI tract. So it's in your dietary substances. And then the way that we get rid of it primarily is through the kidneys, through urine. Okay. Um, about we have about a kilogram of calcium in our, in our bodies. And most of that is in the bones out of what the stuff that's not in the bones, that's in the extracellular fluid. I already said 50% of it is active ionized calcium, 40% bound to those plasma proteins such as albumin. And then the 10%, um, is again, the complexed calcium. Okay. This little flow chart shows the things that happen. Um, so, you know, what you take in is what you get. Okay. So, since this is the only way the calcium comes in, if we're not taking in enough or something happens that's not helping um, the intestinal absorption, okay, that's not working well, it's not absorbing properly, just because of the, the intestines themselves, or we don't have the ability to, uh, to absorb, um, or the hormones telling the intestinal, um, cells to absorb isn't working. Then we've got a real problem because then we're not getting in enough. And so if we're not getting enough in the dietary means, we're going to have this blood calcium level drop. And the parathyroid hormone, um, the parathyroid has these little calcium level receptors and it's going to say, oh wait, blood calcium level dropped and it's getting too low. And then we're going to start having real problems like laryngospasm and cardiac arrhythmias. So we need to fix that. So how do we fix it? So how do we fix blood calcium level that goes down? Well, we tell the kidneys to stop peeing it out right? And we tell the bones that, oh, we need some calcium. So osteoclasts get to business and start chipping off some of that, that mineralized bone. Okay. So it's all about the PTH. Okay. For this PTH, for this vitamin D3. Okay. Here we go. So vitamin D3 is actually called 125 dihydroxy cola calciferol and the reason why it's called cola calciferol is because it is a derivative of cholesterol so it is a a steroid hormone um and it is made by um multiple pathways okay so your skin starts the whole process then it goes to the liver and it becomes um, vitamin D2. And then it goes to the kidneys for the final stage. And the kidneys are the ones that actually make the final activated vitamin D3. Okay. So vitamin D3 um, <clears throat> we can take in a form of vitamin D3 in our milk, in our vitamins that we take. Um, if you eat fish, if you eat organ meats, um, so seafood is great 
Organ meats is another way we get a lot of vitamin D3. Wearing long sleeves and protecting yourself from the sun constantly is not how we get vitamin D3 because you're blocking it at that very first step where the sun needs to be act the skin needs to be activated or um irradiated with UVB rays. Okay, UVB, not UVA, UVB rays. So um, this is a, a pretty interesting thing. You know, sunblock is a big thing because of skin cancer. So, uh, you know, you got to go one way or the other. You can get vitamin D3 and pills and go eat a piece of liver or some fish, right? Um, oily fish. Uh, but maybe you might want to skip that skin cancer piece right okay so it, it's you know it's odd okay so talked about how skin um goes through this whole process to get the very active metabolite the 125 dihydroxy see they they opt out they go oh, dihydroxy vitamin d Cola calciferol. Okay, you need to understand what that is. Cola calciferol. Um, so 125 dihydroxy cola calciferol. This is monohydroxy, right? So um, how we get it? Three organs involved: skin, liver, kidneys. Okay. Um, parathyroid hormone. Major. Major hormone that regulates calcium levels okay parathyroid hormone its job is to affect all of the places that will raise calcium levels okay so it goes to the bones and stimulates those osteoclasts to to resorb bone and, and release the calcium into the bloodstream it goes to the kidneys and says hey um how about if we reabsorb all that calcium instead of peeing it out please um and it also will tell the kidneys that they can start peeing out some phosphorus too by the way um but it will then go to the intestinal cells the intestinal epithelial cells and tell them you need to be absorbing the calcium please because we we have a problem with our calcium levels dropping so remember parathyroid hormone glands or parathyroid glands um have calcium sensing receptors in them that allow it to see when the calcium levels drop if it gets too high or it starts getting high then parathyroid glands just don't release the parathyroid hormone to make everything increase right so it's a down regulation thing um so the gi tract the intestinal <clears throat> tract um needs you we need the intestine to be absorbing properly okay so some things can affect absorption so um celiac disease can affect absorption um any kind of gi surgery can affect the mucosal membrane working properly um bacterial or parasitic intestinal diseases that cause inflammation like colitis or or gastritis or not sorry not gastritis so much as um enteritis okay um can cause problems so because anytime that there's inflammation and excessive mucus um the it the absorption decreases okay things go flooding out when you have diarrhea and you can't absorb very well um so we need to have a normal amount of vitamin d available to help tell those intestinal cells hey we need to absorb this calcium okay um kidneys
Kidneys have a role in that they get rid of excess calcium. Okay, their job, get rid of it or reabsorb it, right? You reabsorb it or you, you let it go through and, and pee it out, okay? So if the kidneys, the kidney tubules are not working properly. So if there's kidney failure, kidney disease of some sort that's affecting the glomerulus, affecting the, the kidney tubules, then that's going to impair the calcium metabolism. Okay. This PHPT, that's the primary hypoparathyroidism. Um, remember that um, too much parathyroid hormone is going to affect the kidney tubules and say, hey, we need to um, parathyroidism. We need to keep reabsorbing all this stuff and, and, and doing what we're doing and, and then we get excessive amounts of calcium um, in our systems. But another thing that can happen is that the kidneys themselves can be a problem that causes secondary hyperparathyroidism. So the kidneys not responding to the parathyroid hormone um, and excreting the calcium anyway can cause the parathyroid glands to make a bunch of parathyroid hormone to try to increase the calcium it's it's a mess okay um one of the other things that happens and one of the things that is common is that people um form kidney stones and nearly all kidney stones are calcium based calcium oxalate is the most common type of kidney stone form not saying all of them are just saying it is the most common so calcium oxalate is a really common type of kidney stone um bone turnover bone remodeling that whole, i was talking about how it that gets recycled and re, and remodeled and and reconfigured it's constantly happening um because osteoblasts and osteoclasts need something to do um so there's this dense cortical bone around the outer edges of your um long bones most of your other bones have a, a dense outer structure um, and then inside um, you have that spongy looking bone which is called trabeculi the trabeculi is the actual bone part of it there's spaces in between all of that um, things from a and p okay um, hypercalcemia, whenever your blood calcium levels go above the expected normal range, um, typically eating too much calcium will not make that happen because you're going to pee out any excess. Um, but, you know, there's interesting things that happen here when you're looking at your albumin levels um, with in association with calcium. Okay. So low serum albumin, um, people would expect to have a low total calcium because that 40% of calcium is binding to albumin. So if the albumin is not there to bind to, we're going to lose it. It's going to go out and get peed out. Okay. If you have high serum albumin, then that may increase the amount that you see. So a patient who has it was dehydrated and when they have a high serum albumin may also see you may also see a higher um level of total calcium. Um remember that primary hypoparathyroidism is the most common cause of hypercalcemia found in outpatients. So they typically don't even know that anything is going on and then we have to start looking for tumors. Unless, of course, all of their electrolytes are increased. And then we start looking at their water levels, right? Look at that anion gap and whatnot. Okay. So, um, there are some other types of hyperparathyroidism. Um, typically, these things down here um, are caused, but it's a secondary hyperparathyroidism. Okay, um, endocrine causes of hypercalcemia, too much vitamin D, 
So then you're absorbing way too much and utilizing it and moving it to where it needs to go. Um, too much parathyroid hormone um, because of something happening with the parathyroid gland itself. Okay. And I keep telling you, typically tumors of some sort, doesn't have to be malignant, can be benign. Okay. Adeno adenomas are common. Okay. Um, these are the things that can happen <clears throat> with too much calcium. Okay. Anorexia is that you don't want to eat constipation. It typically anorexia and constipation go together because constipation can cause nausea and vomiting. So then you don't want to eat like that. Um, <clears throat> so these are all things that you can look at. Okay. Um, familial hypo calciuric hypercalcemia. What does that mean? Genetic, too little calcium in the urine. So your kidneys aren't releasing as much as they should. So you're getting too much calcium in the blood. This is typically a, a um, mutation for that calcium sensing receptors in the parathyroid glands. Um, so, you know, it's not anything that you can help. It's going to be fine because you, genetically you've been hypercalcemic all this time. So it's not going to affect you because that's how you were born and your body already gets it. It's a normal thing for you. Um, Addison's, um, remember this is the electrolytes and the renal tubular secretion and, and whatnot. So um, that can have a problem. Hyper hyperthyroidism can also cause hypercalcemia. Not going there. They're not big. They're not huge reasons why. Okay. Um, uh, renal failure is way more common. Okay. So this is a big thing. Renal failure we're not going to excrete the calcium and the phosphates. Okay. So, and then your vitamin D3, that active form is not being produced because of the kidney failure. So, um, this, this, this is not good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then there are some, some medications and things that can affect your calcium levels in that they're affecting the parathyroid and vitamin D levels. Um, hypocalcemia talked about some of these things already. What you can see, um, these are way more complex, but you know, it's the, to us, to figure out if a person has hypocalcemia, um, measuring the ionized calcium is way important. Okay. So way back with the electrolytes, um, case studies, there was that lethargic baby, right? Um, and the doctor ordered an ionized calcium and everybody was like, Oh, the reason why they did it, they want to see if there's enough calcium. Mm, yeah, no. Because we look at total calcium and we want to know that there's enough calcium, right? The ionized calcium ha is the active form of the calcium. So the reason why he ordered it um, was because of the lethargy he saw in the in the baby. They were flaccid. They were not no no muscle tension tone, right? So it's like, oh my goodness, is this botulism or is it ionized calcium? We just don't have enough ionized calcium in there. Um, because the ionized calcium is the stuff that is the active stuff that actually makes things happen. Okay. So that was something that a lot of you missed, even though I did talk about ionized calcium being um, really important to muscles and nerves. Okay. Um, hypocalcemia um, <clears throat> if for some reason, um, it is not a parathyroid thing, um, and parathyroid things is, is pretty important because some people like when they have the thyroidectomies, um, they can't, they can't leave the parathyroids there or they 
accidentally excise parathyroids at the same time, um, that kind of, that becomes a little bit of a problem. Um, because then, you know, you can end up with too little calcium and nobody regulating it. Okay. Um, so we never remove parathyroids on purpose. Okay. We try not to anyway, unless, you know, we absolutely have to because there's malignancy there. Um, <clears throat> but we, we try really hard to leave the parathyroids there because they're what helps regulate the calcium levels. Um, and trust me, if humans had to do that, we would get it all wrong all the time. All right. I'm, I'm moving. I'm moving as fast as I can. Um, so I talked about the neck surgery, um, accidentally doing it. Autoimmune destruction could be bad. Um, deposition of minerals, um, like metals in, in parathyroid can, can be a problem. And then magnesium has an effect on the whole endocrine piece of it. Okay. Um, celiac sprue okay remember celiac is big thing um dumping syndrome so you take in a, a large amount of food and the and gi system says whoa too much and they make you just flush everything out okay i'm it's you eat a big meal and you're like oh i gotta go to the bathroom mm -hmm. yep dumping syndrome um some people will have dumping syndrome constantly. Some people do not. Okay. Kidneys, bad, bad thing. Remember, kidneys are really involved in this whole thing. Um, talked about that, talked about that, talked about that. I'm going, I'm going. Um, okay, good. If you make sure you read through those last few slides, because I am not going to cover all of those. Okay. Bye. Last one.